everybody. I think we're going to begin. Uh, my name is Susan Derwin, and I am the director of the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center. Um, welcome. It's uh, to today's lecture, which is part of the IUC's year-long series, The Humanities and the Brain. And I want to remind you that next Thursday, Anjan Chatterjee will be speaking here at 4 o'clock at the IUC, and his talk will be on the neuroscience of aesthetics and art. So I hope you can make it to this talk as well. Today, Professor Kenneth Kozik will speak, be speaking. Uh, Ken is no stranger to the humanities. He completed a BA and an MA in English literature from Case Western Reserve University before getting his MD in the Medical College of Pennsylvania. He served as a resident and then chief resident in neurology at Tufts New England Medical Center and went on to hold a series of academic positions at the Harvard Medical School and other institutions, including the Massachusetts General Hospital and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. In 2004, he joined the UCSB faculty as the Harriman Professor of Neuroscience Research and as co-director of the Neuroscience Research Institute. At UCSB, he runs the Cossack Molecular and Cellular Neurobiology Lab, and he also founded and served as the medical director of Cottage Center for Brain Fitness. Ken is the recipient of numerous awards from institutions such as MIT, Harvard, the American Association of Neuropathologists, the Alzheimer's Association, NASA, and the city of Santa Barbara itself. He has co-authored or edited eight books, including When Someone You Love Has Alzheimer's, <coughs> The Alzheimer's Solution, How Today's Care is Failing Millions, and How We Can Do Better, no, The Alzheimer's Solution, colon, How Today's Care is Failing Millions and How We Can Do Better, and Outsmarting Alzheimer's Disease. And he has also published 197 original research reports and 84 reviews. I can't even imagine. Two years ago, the federal government launched an initiative called BRAIN, an acronym that stands for Brain Research to Advanced Innovative Neurotechnologies. This large-scale partnership between public and private research institutions is designed to catalyze discovery and innovation in neuroengineering. Ken is at the helm of the campus-wide program to foster such collaborative brain research among the fields of engineering, neuroscience, physics, computer science, biology, psychology, history, literature, communications, and art. The research that he will present today concerns the neurological and biological underpinnings of social processes. Describing these processes, Ken writes, the repertoire of pro-social behaviors is vast. How much eye contact we make, how much affection we show, how much concern we feel for the plights of others, what we reveal to others and what we don't. In a sense, the motivation for language itself is a pro-social activity. Of course, these areas of neuroscientific inquiry are also of central concern to fields such as linguistics, anthropology, cultural studies, literary studies, and history, to name only some of the many fields in the humanities that also study how individuals and groups form bonds, encourage or discourage empathy, and create representations of themselves and their worlds through language and other symbolic systems. Given their shared interests, it seems all the more crucial that the neurosciences and the humanities continue to cultivate the very lines of communication and exchange each understands as central to their respective enterprise. And I just want to take a moment to mention that on January 28th at the IMC, we will be holding a conversation among humanists and neuroscientists, including Ken and also Julie Carlson from the English department. Uh, so I hope that you can come here to take part in that conversation. Ken himself has been working to advance such interdisciplinary dialogue by co-teaching a course on memory with Professor Dominique Julien of the French department, who's also here today, hi Dominique, and uh, more broadly through her, the approach he takes to elucidating the function of the brain. In his own words, there are no boundaries here. What we are trying to accomplish is so massive, 
so important that we need everybody, engineers, scientists, artists, musicians, historians, investment bankers, patients, doctors, and parents. If we are going to solve the greatest mystery of all time, we're going to need a lot of brain power. I am pleased to welcome Ken and his immense brain power to present his talk today. Nature spends the past few million years experimenting with the pro-social brain. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction. I thank you very, very much. And uh, thank you all for coming today. So I'm going to um, begin with um, a question here. Um, this is, uh, question is, the hominid, the hominid genus, where did they all go? Um, you might recognize pictures like this. These are all our cousins, our ancestors. These are all skulls that have been found over the last uh, three million years that um, are very close to human beings, to us, the homo sapiens. And um, yet they've all gone extinct. Uh, the one that has been here most recently uh, along with us are the Neanderthals at the top. Um, and you can see over in the corner, are, that's where we are, homo sapiens. But most of them have become extinct even long before Homo sapiens even emerged. So lots of different sort of subspecies here that are emerging, but very hard to get traction, very hard to survive for a long period of time. Um, Homo sapiens has been around maybe for, well, it's, it's a little bit unclear, maybe 100,000 or 150,000 years. Um, Neanderthals were here for 300,000 years, so uh, we have a little ways to go before we outpace them, but um, even they succumbed. Now, it's not the case that when species uh, diverge, and there are many, many subspecies, that necessarily their, um, all their closest relatives are going to become extinct. And the most famous example of this are beetles. Um, here is a famous quote from uh, Haldane. Um, here he was in the company of a group of theologians and was asked, what, would, what could one conclude as to the nature of the creator from the study of his creation? And Haldane, Haldane said, an inordinate fondness for beetles. <laughs> um, there are 350,000 known different species of beetles on the planet, and uh, some people say that the actual number is closer to several million. So, they, and they all live together. There's no problem. So, in our lineage, here, you can see that um, we have a uh, very modern homo, homo sapiens on the top. Uh, these um, are closest relatives. There's the Neanderthals up there on the top. Others have been discovered rather recently, such as the Denosovans out in uh, Siberia, uh, Homo florensis in Indonesia. Um, they have, in the literature, they've been called hobbits because they're very small, but they are clearly show all the features similar to us. Um, and the most recent one is Homo naledi, uh, found in South Africa, deep, deep underground in a cave that's been very, very hard to get to. So they're all, and they all, they all are extremely close to human beings in terms of their bone structure and their skulls. Um, now, of course, what we always learn is, is that the, the, our closest relative are the chimps, and that's true. Um, there you see them on the bottom. Um, the way these pictures are drawn is, is that when you look there, I wonder if you, is there a pointer here? If not, I can work my way around that. But if you look back there where Homo sapiens comes together with Neanderthals, there's what we call a branch point, a node. So there's a common ancestor that gives rise to both Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. They don't, it's not like humans evolved from Neanderthals. There was a common ancestor that gave rise to both of them. There's a common ancestor that gave rise to all of these hominids and also gave rise to the chimps. So chimps are like another whole branch. They're really far from us and they're still surviving here, although, many, although they're also in jeopardy. Now, another thing happened. 
And this is really interesting. So here again, this is the same picture all over again, with all the hominids here, but this time you see their skulls. And on the bottom, if you can see it, is a timeline. Those numbers are millions of years ago. And this, there's a circle there in which you see these species such as there's the Neanderthal and Homo sapiens and Heidelbergensis. Something happened about two million years ago in which the brain size really enlarged massively. So our most close relatives, those from about two million to 1.5 million years ago, underwent a massive brain expansion. Now, that's a big deal because for many reasons, and here's the picture of brain expansion that's represented by the skulls. Um, so we have this strategy, late in hominid evolution, in which brain the brain expands. But that's a very expensive strategy. It's not, um, brain tissue is very expensive stuff, and what do I mean by that? Well, our brain is only uh, three pounds of our entire body, and yet it uses 20% of the energy that we, are, that we take in. It's an expensive organ, much, much more than any other organ in life, just three pounds using 20%. That's like one country using so many resources in the world. Um, you can think of who that country is. <laughs> um, and uh, I'll give you a more astounding fact which is, in a 10-year-old kid, the brain is even more expensive. It's 50% of the energy that a 10-year-old kid takes in is going to maintain this expensive work, to generate all the energy needed to maintain the brain. So, in, of course, in biology, fitness is the key word. And if you have something that's very expensive, it takes a lot of energy to support it, you better be getting something in return. So what do we get in return? What is the fitness advantage of an expensive brain. Because the brain has indeed increased uh, dramatically from 500 to 1,350 uh, cubic centimeters. So let's try to explore that question a little bit. Well, here we are again. These are all our ancestors and cousins and closest relatives. And none of them survived. They're all extinct. You can think of them all as experiments of nature. You can think of them as failed experiments because they all died off. And I'm going to put the thesis out here that many of these experiments involved tinkering with the social brain, perhaps unsuccessful tinkering with the social brain. Um, because, and this is just a thesis, a hypothesis, evolving a social structure among hominids is required for success. I don't know for sure that's true, but that's the idea that we're floating. And, um, and that is the, what we get from having a social brain is how we pay for it <coughs> by the, all the different pro-social aspects that I'm going to tell you about in a moment. But it's not easy to get social organization right. You can, it's very easy to have conflict and lots of reasons why social organization can go astray. And perhaps many of the reasons why the other hominids went extinct is because they didn't quite get it right and we don't even know if we got it right yet. But social, a social fabric is absolutely fundamental to biology. You can't have, you know, it just goes right across the board. So let's go all the way back to bacteria. There's a, uh, Bacteria, when they're growing in very low density and or very high density, all packed together. And bacteria have a whole system, a chemical system, in which they know how many other bacteria are in the culture. A technical word for it is called quorum sensing. You don't have to worry about the name. It just means that bacteria know who's around them and how many are around them. And many, many uh, organisms have this social structure. There's some meerkats down there. There's some snails uh, up there all the rock together, birds on the wire here in Santa Barbara. It's, if you just look around you and you will always see almost all creatures have this social structure. Some are part of an extreme, maybe sloths like to be by themselves or Tasmanian devils, but most organisms really are quite social. And um, we're pretty special in that regard. So, I want to show you, I'm going to show you something here. Uh, I'm going to show you a quick, uh, 
video, which uh, I think is pretty amazing about human social behavior. This car crash motorcyclist was underneath the car. She got down there and she just saw the person lying there. She called all these bystanders. They spontaneously organized themselves into this. Together they, they found the right positions. Holy crap. You see the guy? There he is. Somebody takes the job of pulling him out. Oh my gosh. And they're all working. Oh my gosh. Uh, you might remember that incident. Maybe it was a big, it was on the news about several years ago. Um, he survived. Well, it doesn't look it, but he did survive. Um, but that, that crash happened suddenly. And then all these people just organized. They all took a job. And they successfully got the guy out from under the car. Humans have this remarkable ability uh, to be quite, um, uh, to work together. And um, we have some terms for these kinds of behaviors. So the term we use is pro-social. And many organisms have pro-social behavior. Uh, you know, ours has some unique features to it. Uh, this is voluntary social behavior to benefit unrelated individuals or society. Unrelated individuals, that's important. Um, it's uh, well, a division of labor, like you saw in that car accident. There's, uh, we see this in, in, in training, in armies working together, care for the needy. Um, often there's a regulated, uh, it's all regulated by a shared moral system that's enforced, albeit imperfectly, by third party sanctions. That is, people might join an army, work together, because they all believe that someone is the enemy. We're really together even in death. Cemeteries are places where people like to bury themselves. Um, what's the motivation for working together? Could be empathy, could be concern for the welfare and rights of others, could be egotistical or practical concerns, self-interest, reciprocity. Altruism is a special form of pro-social behavior in which we show an unselfish interest toward others. Now, as I said, many organisms have pro-social behavior, but if we care, care, compare this to our closest relatives, to other primates, they also cooperate, but in much more smaller groups. Um, and, um, and there's another form, an extreme pro-social behavior, which is seen in a number of organisms. You might know this term, eusocial. Here, cooperation has gone to an absolute extreme. This is not what we do. In this case, uh, individuals become <coughs> genetically committed to doing just one job, like in termites or ants, where the only thing they can do is be the worker ants. They don't do anything else. They don't even have offspring. They, they become sterile, so that all the offspring are, the, the germ line is carried in a few individuals, and the other members of the colony have these jobs that don't pass on their genes at all. That's what new social behavior is. And, um, uh, and the division of labor is divided into castes. Some of them are workers. Extreme examples are, I forget, I think this might be, I forget what, it's termites in which one of the, um, one specialized job is to just sort of hang on a limb and fill your body up with food so other animals can sort of glom on and, and eat the contents of their bodies. So uh, it's really, uh, highly, highly specialized behavior. And this kind of pro-social behavior has evolved repeatedly and independently of many, many times. Um, there's even um, uh, a mammal that has pro-social behavior called the naked mole rat. But there, uh, but honeybees and termites and ants are the most famous examples. So widely across evolution, uh, evolution has played around with various forms of social behavior and in its most extreme form is eusocial behavior. Now, there's another feature of what have led to perhaps some interesting developments in the area of human social behavior. Because in our own evolution, we went through a time that's known as abolition. That is, there were lots of um, our closest relatives around us in Africa. And, uh, we don't know exactly what happened, but there were uh, probably catastrophic events in which the human homo sapiens population on the Earth, about uh, maybe 50 or 75,000 years ago, 
massively constricted so that there were only about 15,000 homo sapiens on this entire planet. That's called a bottleneck. And you can see that on one side of the bottleneck, when there's lots of us, there's all these colors, which means our diversity. There's great diversity, a lot of genetic diversity. But only the red and the blue people survived. So they come out of the bottleneck here. And now, only as we, those 15,000 people now expand to the 7.5 billion people on the planet today, they've all become from a small number of founders. So human beings, compared to a lot of other species, have very limited diversity. We're very, very similar to each other, genetically, compared to most other organisms, many other organisms. And furthermore, to what made our populations even more sparse was that something, I don't know what it was, curiosity perhaps, drove us to leave Africa, where Homo sapiens originated, and begin to populate the entire planet. So we, we left Africa, and all across Asia, there was a land bridge where the uh, Bering Strait is, came down the coast, the Pacific coast, all the way to South America, populated Europe, and uh, in a relatively short period of time, over tens of thousands of years, this small population was even more sparse as it spread out around the planet. Very small groups going and starting their own families in different places. Now that's very important genetically because it means that a group of people living in one place are just, um, are no longer having any offspring with someone living in another place. So it's only the genes that are, that of the people that have said, gone to the Americas that are now um, um, expanding in the population and the others are lost. So many of the differences, the racial differences between individuals originate from these migratory patterns. So, um, so let's, so, so as part of this thesis, we would have to say that uh, since nature tends to tinker a lot with social behavior, we would expect that even in the human population there would be a very wide range of social behaviors. And indeed there is. So here is a, um, um, of the bottom are two uh, clinical syndromes I'm going to tell you about with extreme social behaviors. But in the middle, between them, is really us. It's a social network. It's actually a social network uh, made up of um, high school dating partners. And um, so you can see there are some people that date a lot of people. Those are like hubs. They're in the center. They have connections to a lot of people. And uh, there are some people out on the periphery that may just date one person. There are probably people that aren't even represented here that don't date anybody. They're not connected, even on the, on the graph, on this network. So you can see here is the connectivity that just the safe, a social uh, network, a dating network in high school, shows you this range of behaviors and how much, you know, how much people are connected. Here's another example. This is how much uh, academics collaborate with each other. Um, <laughs> So you know, very often there are people uh, publish together or write grants together. That's what these different colors are. They're basically, um, how many people are publishing together in red or writing grants together in blue or working together in some other way in green. And you can see a lot of there's, there's a lot that clusters in the center. A lot of academics are working with other academics, but there are also all these like loners out there on the periphery. <laughs> They're working on their own. What's that? They're, so the unit that's, those, yeah, that's not provided by uh, discipline, but maybe that's who's out there. So you can see this range of social behaviors in almost everything uh, we look at. But where nature, when nature is experimenting, it's playing around with genes. And the uh, place where this is most dramatic is in those clinical syndromes I showed you. On one side, autism, you know some of the features of autism, and on the other side, a syndrome I'll tell you about in a moment, which is really almost the opposite of autism. So let's talk about autism first. Um, I think you know a little bit about this. Um, there is uh, often this, uh, a very difficult, a lot of difficulties with social behavior. This is impaired social behavior. It's one extreme where the social aspects of uh, humans have not developed. 
very well. Um, this hyper awareness of sensory uh, phenomena, just being things that we might take for granted, just uh, you know, bright light, or sound that we just ignore and filter out, is just very intense for an autistic individual. Um, this very high rule-based behavior where toys have to be lined up before the kid can fall asleep, always lining things up, stacking things, very, very part of the char uh, characteristic. Um, there's a child down there with a telephone. This is not an autistic child because this person has picked up a phone to engage in a social interaction. They may pretend that she's talking to someone else. The autistic child would be much more interested in the dial and what's inside, opening up the phone, and seeing how it works. So there's very, very different types of constructs here of, uh, of this extreme when it comes to social behavior. Uh, there's a lot of genes involved in autism that have been, um, that have been mutated, which again is a natural experiment. On the opposite extreme, here's a Lewy syndrome. Uh, these kids have a typical appearance. They uh, have uh, this kind of uh, uh, facial features that have been called elfin. And uh, they, have, uh, they do also have intellectual disability. But their language tends to be rather intact. They're pretty good at speaking. Um, they have other problems um, here, but uh, they have remarkable musical abilities. Um, but the two main features of Williams syndrome, which really makes them the opposite of autism, is that one, they have this remarkable, outgoing, engaging social personality. Some of the others, these uh, societies where parents bring all their kids with Williams syndrome together. You walk into a room with these kids, and they come right up to strangers. They're all around you. They're smiling at you. They want to shake your hand. They have incredible eye contact. They just, they love strangers. They love adults, strangers, and they're not afraid of strangers. Um, they have more trouble forming lasting relationships, but they have this very engaging personality, and they, because they're intellectually impaired, but they have this language ability, there's a decoupling of language and intelligence, which we often think goes together, but in their case, it's dissociated, and I'll show you two, again, extreme examples, one on the autism side, where this child, just five years old, is drawing a horse, with dimensionality to it. This is a child with autism who could not even talk. And yet, she had the ability uh, to draw this, to sketch out a book with this you know, incredible ability of three dimensionality and shading, all the things that uh, um, you would expect in a much more sophisticated artist. On the other hand, here is um, an autistic uh, Williams syndrome child who was asked to draw an elephant, and that's all the child did. Um, but when asked to describe it, here's what she said. What an elephant is, it is one of the animals. What an elephant does, it lives in the jungle. It can also live in the zoo. And what it has, it has long gray ears, fan ears. I love that use of the word, fan ears. Ears that can blow in the wind. It has a long trunk that can pick up grass or pick up hay. If they're in a bad mood, it can be terrible. If the elephant gets mad, it can stop. Stop the low frequency word we use here. It could charge. Sometimes elephants can charge. They have big, long tusks that can damage a car. It would be dangerous when they're in a pinch. When they're in a bad mood, it can be terrible. You don't want an elephant as a pet. <laughs> you have a dog or a <laughs> Look at the distinction between the artistic ability of those two kids and the distinction between the verbal ability and rendering this visual ability. So these, these are conditions in which we know something about their genetic basis. And um, for Lucas syndrome, we know actually quite a lot. So here are chromosomes that are all colored real pretty. And um, we have these uh, 23 chromosomes. You see them down there, the number 22, and the sex chromosomes, the Y and the X. And, um, and those chromosomes are where the DNA is. The chromosomes are in all cells in your body. Probably rare exceptions. And uh, there's a place on chromosome 7 where that red arrow points upward where 25 genes in Williams syndrome are just deleted. They, they lack 25 genes. Actually, the more accurate way to say it is you, know, you get genes from your mother and your father. They lack 
one set of those genes. They didn't get the genes from, say, their mother, even though they had the mother. So they have, they have half the dose of 25 genes that they should have. And the missing 25 genes now gives them the ability to describe an elephant uh, that the child can't really draw. I mean, in some path that we don't understand at all, it's really a little bit assertive, I think, perhaps an overstatement to try to say there's any direct line between the genes and the behavior. But that's the challenge of biology, is to understand that, because that's what they're starting with. They're starting with missing 25 genes, and they all end up, the syndrome is very similar. Almost all kids with Sloven syndrome have that, what we call phenotype. That's the appearance. That's what we see. So those 25 genes are doing really something interesting. And how can we explore that? So I'm going to, um, for anybody here that might um, uh, feel just a little bit nervous about science, I'm going to um, just ease into it. Um, and start with uh, the central dogma. I hope it's not insulting to anybody just to tell you that uh, the, um, the genes are coded in the DNA. That's where the 25 genes are missing, right there. That's the cell that you're looking at. And that blue thing is the nucleus of the cell, the center of the cell where the DNA is housed. Every cell in the body has all that. And the DNA that makes RNA, that's that red ribbon. RNA is just a copy of the DNA. That's all it is. You copy it first, and then the RNA then makes the proteins that build our body, our strong bones, skin, and all that stuff. So we have, so that's that's the kind of thing we're we're looking at. That's what we have to explore to get the answer to this problem. And uh, but of course, it's much more complex. And uh, so now let's look at it in a different way. So down at the bottom is the DNA, and. Uh, if you look even lower down, where I have four letters in the TGC, DNA is made up of a long stretch of these four letters. This is the genetic code. We have three billion of those letters in the TGC in all kinds of ways running through all the cells. And they're a little bit different in everybody, but not very much. And uh, a bunch of them are together. There's three billion of them. But you might take, say, a few thousand of them. And you might use 1,000 of them to make a gene. So that gene could be called F. And another 3,000 of them might be gene G. So that's the DNA level. Now let's just skip that next in between level for a moment. I mentioned that there's RNA. So the gene then makes this RNA. And I'm going to call that IGH. It's just a copy of it. But, um, it, but it's not just one RNA. It's all the RNAs together. It's, these genes are all working together, and they make a whole collection of RNAs. So it's a little bit complicated, but uh, let's just let's breeze by it for a moment. Just take my word for it. I mentioned how that's going to make protein. And then eventually, all of it's going to come together and make a phenotype. A phenotype is the way we look. You know, it's what color hair you have, it's what your personality is. That's all phenotype. So all those genes and RNAs and proteins are going to work together in some way to make who we are, from behavior to appearance to our bone structure to everything. Now, people don't like the idea that genes are so deterministic. You know, it's just it really is not something that's a very pleasant thing to think about, that you know, you're born with a set of genes, and it's going to determine everything about you. You can't do anything about it. And biologists have realized that genes are not completely deterministic. And that's that layer of here we see it as epigenetics. So epigenetics will come in, and epigenetics are factors in the environment that determine how easily a gene can be read or not read, how easily it can make RNA and protein. So, well, we can't do anything about the sequence, the ATGCs in our gene. We all have genes that are going to be the same throughout our life. The environment can determine how much of a gene is being made. Epigenetics is the word for that. And that is where we have the ability to actually alter gene expression. 
Genies do not completely equal fate. They have this, uh, this some degree of malleability. Um, if, if a child is abused, then there are probably epigenetic changes that have gone on in that child's genome that affect their behavior in their life. If a person has grown up in a very harsh environment, there are epigenetic changes that go on. If they've had everything they need in life, uh, good food, everything, there's other epigenetic changes. So environment affects the way genes are turned on and turned off. That's what's going on in one side. Now, so I mentioned the genes, the DNA is making the RNA, and it's making lots of RNAs in different patterns. So it turns out, here's one pattern, here's another pattern. Um, you can just see these are different patterns. This is like every one of these thin lines along here is a different RNA, and RNAs are made in all different patterns. And then, depending on these patterns, you get this phenotype. You know, your facial morphology, whatever it happens to be. But I'm still missing a big step in here. This step. Because all we did so far was talk about DNA, RNA, and protein. But how about the cells? There's this, there's these, the body is making the wall, the brain works. The brain is using all of this pathway in each of these 86 billion neurons in the brain, each one with 5 to 10,000 synapses. All of that's going on. Every single one has the process that I just told you about. Every single one of those 86 billion cells. Remember, there are 3 billion uh, nucleotides in the genome, and there's 86 billion brain cells. So there's no way it's a one-to-one -one map. It's not like one nucleotide is controlling one brain cell. It's, there's a much more complex problem here, because somehow we all have the same linear arrangement of all these ATGCs, and we use that to now generate massive numbers of brain cells. And the way in which this is happening, the reason this is so important developmentally and for something like autism and Williams syndrome is because the rate at which this is happening during fetal development, there's the numbers. The fetal brain makes a half a million new neurons a minute. And those neurons are forming connections with other neurons at synapses at the rate of two million a second. This is what's happening in utero. Can you imagine like your wiring, wiring system that's hooking itself up at the rate of two million connections a second? It's just, it's just staggering to think about that. That's what's going on in the fetus. So the brain is developing and there's some other control levels that must be going on because we do think that autism has to do with some miswiring in the brain. Okay, so this was the rapid view of biology. This is like fast pace in biology, you know, experts in biology. And um, we, um, and let's get back to our problem, okay? So, um, so there are divergent behaviors within the genus. We, um, I told you beetles all have divergent behaviors, they did very well. There's a human over there in the background. Uh, actually, how good that was. This is humans, this is the Neanderthal. Neanderthal did not survive, humans did. Something happened in which they lost out. But as I mentioned, other species live very well. They find their own niches to actually survive. And a very interesting example are voles. So, and voles also, different species have quite unique behaviors. So here's a prairie vole in which the male and female are live together. They're, they're thought to be monogamous. And they're, they have what's called affiliated behavior, that is the father will look after the offspring just as, in just, with just as much concern as the mother. So they, this is called affiliated behavior. But there's another goal, one called the Montaigne goal, in which the, um, very closely related, but they don't, they're just the opposite. The, the males are very promiscuous. Once the kids are born, the males leave. And it's interesting. So there's, there's two points I'm going to make here. One is, is that species can work together on the planet with having quite different social behaviors, both of which are successful. 
But also notice here how behaviors come in blocks. You know, it's not necessarily the case that just because the male is promiscuous that he has to also ignore his children. But that does seem to go together. That there's these behavioral packages, at least in both, in which behaviors are pumped into these packages. So we're going to continue on that theme for a little bit here. And uh, so here I've already shown you this. Here are these, this natural, what's called a natural experiment, in which some kids have autism because they have some gene mutations. Williams syndrome has these genes deleted. There's a very small number of people with autism that actually, usually they have a few mutations here and there in the genome. We don't understand fully the genetic basis of autism. But there's a very rare form of autism in which the same place where the Williams syndrome genes are deleted, these kids have that same region triplicated. They not only have the gene from the mother and the father, but they have another copy. The mother might have given them two copies and the father one. So they have an extra copy. When you have too many genes in that same locus, you get autism. So this is a region that's very genetically divergent with regard to just that set of 25 genes. You can go either way on that axis. So, it's really worth looking at what are, just like I mentioned, the bowls and the, the Monte bowls, what are the blocks of behavior that the, these genes mediate? Well, here are the uh, behaviors that are affected in autism and Williams syndrome. Theory of mind, we'll talk about that. Rule-based behavior, language, the language, uh, uh, these kids don't speak very well. Um, very often there may not be empathy for others. Their social interactions are impaired, sensory hyper-awareness. I'm going to talk about these a little bit, and so you don't quite follow all of them. Um, I'm going to go into some detail. But this is the package. This is the behavioral package that all goes together. Let's look at that in a little more detail. Let's talk about language first. So, these kids really speak well. They're very, very fluent. They speak almost surprisingly well, considering their intelligence. Autism kids are sometimes even mute. Well, is that real, what is that related to? Well, if we're going to put this into the context of all hominids, we might we want to try to put this into a social module. Maybe the role of language here is not so much to communicate, but for what's called phatic expression. Phatic function is the only function in this, uh, for language is to perform a social task as opposed to conveying information. It's a lot like grooming. So you, some people might say that most of the words we use are really fat or not. I mean, how much of what we say to each other really is conveying information? It's like, how, do you, how are you? You don't care how the person is. You just say, how are you? It's polite. Uh, you talk about the weather, which you have to talk about. Well, an awful lot of our communication is much more phatic. It's just for social discourse because we want to keep relationships between people at a certain civil level. And that is a, perhaps the primary use of language to be social. And then this information, information can be conveyed in a lot of other ways, facial expression, hand movements. Really, the, the, the line, communicating information is probably a small part of the language really does. It's really for social relationships. Talk to somebody, you figure out their friend or enemy, you figure out there's something common or them. That's really what language is doing. The other I mentioned is theory of mind. That's another aspect. I think most of you know what theory of mind means. It's a pair in autism. Just go through this in a few moments. Uh, this is a classic test in which the kid goes into the psychologist and uh, to be with his mother or her mother and uh, the psychologist uh, asks the mother to leave the room, and then the kid has uh, um, uh, takes the psychologist takes the, um, these um, M and M's out of uh, the box and puts pencils into the box. Closes the box, asks the mother to come back in, and says to the kid, "Now, what does your mother think is in that box?" So if the kid is four years old or less the kid will say she thinks pencils are in the box. Because when you're very young, 
you think the other person is thinking exactly what you're thinking. But when you get a little older, the five or six year old kid will say, huh, oh, I mean, that's a good trick. My mom thinks there's actually these smarties, the MMs in, in the box, not what's really in the box. Because the kid now can have a theory of mind for what other people are thinking. That's impaired in autism. Autism individuals don't have that ability to infer what other people are thinking. Now, this can go to really extreme degrees because here are some dogs sitting around playing poker. And, uh, you can now think, well, you know, you're playing poker, you really want to know what the other person is thinking because they may be holding a very bad hand. Think what they're thinking. So, you know, this dog would really like to know what this dog is thinking. But how about this dog knowing what this dog is thinking about that dog? <laughs> That's a level of theory of mind that we don't have. Or, I mean, we might be able to get this, but you can take that further. I mean, how about this dog? I'm you know, thinking about that dog thinking that dog and this dog. This is a level of theory of mind that is really beyond most human beings. So theory of mind is, um, is, has its limitations. Um, this is a humanities audience, so I'm going to show you a quote from a, a book where I think theory of mind is just uh, expressed so well by Dean McElwain in the book uh, Atonement, which was also a movie. I think it was uh, shortlisted in the Booker Award. Uh, you, you know the story of uh, this young girl um, uh, falsely accuses uh, this uh, guy of rape and he goes to jail and she knows very well that uh, her accusation is false and she has to live her life uh, knowing that she made this false accusation. And it's a very much more complex story than that, but um, there's a quote which I think is so useful here. Um, did her sister, this is the main character's sister, also have a real self concealed behind the breaking wing? Did everybody, including her father, Betty Hardman, well, all of you, did they have this real self somewhere in there? Betty Hardman or people that are working on this uh, estate? If the answer was yes, the world, the social world, was unbearably complicated with two billion voices. This was in the 1930s, so there were only two billion people on the planet then. With two billion voices and everyone's thoughts striving in equal importance and everyone's claim on life as intense and everyone thinking they were unique, but no one was. One could drown in their wrongness. That, to me, that's a kind of level of theory of mind which is <coughs> just, you know, gets an overwhelming quality of really being able to, the challenge of putting ourselves in other people's minds when there are eight billion people on the planet. So, um, so here's another behavioral feature that goes together. I mentioned this balance and uh, filter, uh, the ability to balance and filter sensory input. Autistic spectrum disorders, these kids often are just really put off by sensory phenomena. It's really hard for them to pay attention to all the things going on. Uh, you might have seen that in uh, that movie about the curious incident of the dog at night where it's really uh, that's made very, very clear. Sensory hyper awareness in autism. So that goes with the cinema. But again, human behavior for all these parameters lies on the spectrum. So again, in a humanities audience, I really think that Germany, the relevant quote is not a center for Marcel Proust. An hour is not merely an hour, it is a vase full of scents and sounds and projects. An autistic child would find this overwhelming. Proust found this so engaging, just so remarkable, that one hour could have the richness of all of that just packed into it. Same phenomenon. One seeing it as a very, very rich hour, and the other just overwhelmed with fright. So now, I don't want to give you the false impression that that axis is the only way to go. We use the one side from all these behavioral modules and autism on the other. Because there's, you can, there's other ways to go. I mean, you can go online this way into a behavior that's called neurotypical. 
This is also considered the opposite of autism. These people are not intellectually impaired at all. They're very smart. But they're almost, they have this, you, you all know people like this. They just look at you in the eye too much. They don't deviate their eyes when they're talking at all. It's almost overwhelming to talk to them because they're just staring at you and the intensity of the interaction is just so great that um, it becomes a little bit too much. Neurotypicals. Another axis that goes off are people that have a different a, a kind of dementia. It's called it's not Alzheimer's, it's from their temporal dementia, in which they also, these people have certain behaviors that also fit someone on this axis. A lot of these people have this kind of impulsive behavior that's what is guided by the source, having a wonderful time shoes and target. And um, but they have the same kind of rigidity. They must have a piece at 3.30 every day and wear a blue shirt. I mean, it's just, there is this, there are features that go off axis in these different uh, conditions. So I'm going to end by now, the last slide is to sort of come all the way back to the original question. So we have these behavioral modules. We, I put the thesis out there that all these hominids went extinct with the hypothesis that the reason they went extinct was because they failed to get the social modules right. Just the conflicts, it's killing, or survival, or cooperating, or working together. We never ended up behaving like bees, all the worker bees. We never ended up in the kind of environmentally sound, sustainable way. We ended up doing things, we being our mom, know our fate yet, but that at least resulted for some reason going extinct. And it wasn't just human beings killing them, because many of them, most of them died long before we evolved. So if we're going to survive, will humans indeed get it right? We have these problems. Repeated hominid extinctions. We have to deal with them. Our closest relatives went extinct time after time after time. Social organizations that are not adaptive. I don't think that our social organization is particularly adaptive right now. The environment is degrading, war is a lot of reasons why we may not be getting it <coughs> right, even we're not getting it right, perhaps. And at the same time, we have to support this really costly rent. It's not like we can just go hibernate or turn into a sport and become, you know, dry for 3,000 years. It's there's like we have a big problem. We have to take resources to support the costly rain. So to be sort of on the optimistic side, I think the solution is going to be that we develop tools that solve all of those problems. That is, we are able to extend what we do in terms of social organization. We're trying so hard. We hear about social media all the time. Some people love it. Some people complain about it. But we are experimenting with new social structures through social media. We're playing in that realm. The evolution is going on outside of genes. It's going on in the tools we invent. And that level of evolution could be our salvation. Because maybe it's going to make, uh, cut down the costs for our expensive brain, allow us to find a socially adaptable way of living, is perhaps our only hope because old-fashioned evolution, genetic evolution, is really slow. And um, we've got to really hurry. Thank you.